Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second day of the GTP workshop. And I'd like to introduce Mark Rost uh, from the Department of Astrophysical and Planetary Sciences here at the University of Colorado, who's going to be talking about modeling transport using turbulent flow statistics. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity uh, to speak. I really have to apologize uh, for uh, for being so so poorly involved in the workshop. It's it's insane. Um, I'm actually I'd like to thank the people that allowed me to speak early today because I'm actually flying out at noon. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to share this, and I apologize that. Uh, my involvement is so uh, so li limited. Um, what I'd like to tell you about, um, as, as some of you have heard this before, uh, but I'd like to tell you about some successes that we've had uh, modeling scalar transport, first in a point vortex flow where we can reproduce the transport PDFs uh, very well uh, using some simple flow statistics, uh, then some application of that work to stratified turbulence, I'm sorry, this is incomplete. This was work with Pablo Menini, uh, Nico, a graduate student in, in Buenos Aires, Pablo and myself. And then finally, um, how we might extend this to 3D uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So just to make sure that, that uh, we understand the problem, I'm trying to address the, the most basic uh, turbulence problem. Um, what are the properties of the small scale flows? How do they derive from the large scale flows? And given those properties, how do scalar and vectors transport in physical space? And the idea is to develop a model of that transport in physical space based on coherent uh, vortical structures in the flows. And so um, in this sense, uh, to incorporate the phase relationships that those uh, structures uh, uh, contribute uh, in, the, in the modeling of the, of the transport. So the way that uh, we go about doing this is that you can, if you have a scalar quantity C, then of course the solution of the deterministic uh, transport equation is just the integral against the source function. And if that flow, that U, is a turbulent flow, then the expectation value of that concentration at any point in space and time is just uh, the right-hand side, the source at, at some time X prime t prime, and the probability of that uh, parcel at x prime t prime ending up at x and t. So this could be called the probabilistic Green's function of the problem. And so if we knew this object, and so that's the object we're trying to model, then we would know the expectation value of the scalar concentrate. concentrate. If you wanted higher moments, you can do that too, and then this becomes a more complicated object. This becomes the probability that uh, two different parcels at different positions and different times end up at the same position at the same time in different realizations. And so this, this probability is really the generalization of the, of the pair dispersion problem in time reverse. And so the variance of the concentration depends on modeling this probability distribution. I'm going to focus entirely on, on this object uh, today. But just for completeness and to tell you where I'm going, scalars are one thing, but of course vectors are much more interesting. And the same thing can be done with a vector quantity, except you need some probabilistic stress tensor to, to describe how the two very close Lagrangian trajectories uh, uh, diverge. And that will give you essentially the turning of the vector in addition to the transport of the vector quantity. Okay, so uh, one caveat, these formulations have no dissipation, so there's no uh, reconnection um, involved if one would, would successfully do this with a magnetic field. And today I'm going to only talk about scalar transport, and since there's no dissipation at the infinite Peclé number uh, limit. Okay, so 
uh, the idea is let's measure this thing. Well, this thing is almost impossible to measure, right? You have to know the probability that any uh, that a parcel at any position at any time could end up at your position x and t. And so we reduce this problem further. If you think of the problem as isotropic, then this uh, uh, probability density is the probability density of going a certain distance. And if it's isotropic, then it's divided by 2 pi r because it's distributed uniformly around the circumference of the, of the circle at that distance in 2D or the sphere in 3D. Okay? And so the revised goal here is even simpler, and that is, can I model P of R and T, uh, the probability density um, that I travel an Eulerian distance R after a certain amount of time T based just on the turbulent flow statistics? Okay, so we started with a two-dimensional analog. The idea was we have all these vertical structures in the flow. Uh, let's approximate them as point vertices, make a two-dimensional flow of positive and negative vertices. This has some peculiarities in the way uh, it was designed. Uh, we're continuously making vertices and annihilating them with each other, so there's some stirring going on here. There's, in fact, some quasi-3D stretching of these vertices because of those processes. But what we're really are interested in is how these black... Um, how these black Lagrangian tracers uh, uh, move. And this is a periodic, tw twice periodic domain. And so we trace these, these Lagrangian tracers and ask what's the probability that they move a certain Eulerian distance. And then the idea is what insight that, that we gain from here can we use to understand transport in a much more realistic and complicated uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So this is the model we started with. And um, we go in here and we measure the probability density of, of traveling a distance r from any position along any of these trajectories. And then we stack those PDFs and you get a, a two-dimensional PDF. And this is the logarithm of that probability density for three different uh, such simulations. And to lowest order, and the red is a, is a Rayleigh fit, it's two-dimensional system, so a Rayleigh distribution is the random walk in two dimensions. And the red is the Rayleigh fit. And to lowest order, these distributions are fit by a Rayleigh distribution that, uh, where the variance grows with time. And that variance grows for these three simulations ballistically at short times because the Lagrangian particles are just moving B delta T and diffusively at long times. And so this is the classic scalar transport. But the question is, what can you actually uh, deduce from this? And, and, the, and the most interesting aspect of this is that even though these scalings are very robust, the actual transport of the scalar properties is nothing like uh, diffusive. Even though the scaling is diffusive, the actual transport, and I'll show you in a second, you can see there's a, at very long times, even when the scaling is diffusive, there's a very high probability that you go long, far distances. So let me show that in a little more detail, and then we'll make cuts. At very low, t some short times in the ballistic regime, you have a slight excess uh, for long distance transport. At intermediate times, more integral times of the problem, you have a deficit in your transport. And at very long times, you have an excess. And if you look at those uh, with cuts, you see uh, very clearly that you have a, a tail at short times below the Lagrangian uh, integral time. You have a strong deficit in intermediate times and at times uh, greater than the Eulerian integral time, when the flow is completely decorrelated, you have a tail that's in excess of the random walk distribution that you would expect. And so the question is, what explains uh, these things? And can, and can we model them? And then um, can we uh, use that same kind of model in more realistic flows? So let me tell you what the, the bottom line is. The bottom line is that this deficit, I mean, this excess 
is simply the reflection that the, the speed distribution of the Lagrangian velocity is not uh, Rayleigh. Okay? There's, this is just V delta T, and the velocity distribution is not Rayleigh, and so you get uh, an enhancement at sh very short times below the Lagrangian integral time you get an enhancement of the tail just because the velocity distribution isn't Gaussian. Each component is not Gaussian. Um, and it's particular for this flow, and it looks different for other flows depending on what that underlying Lagrangian velocity distribution is. This deficit is caused by trapping of the particles uh, in eddies. And so you, get, uh, you go less far than you would expect. Um, and you go less far than you would in a random walk because you get trapped around uh, uh, in eddies around uh, in in eddies of all scales, and and this excess is only seen in some simulations, and it turns out that it's an excess due to a time varying large scale flow. So imagine if you had a drift, if you had a, a mean a large scale flow, then you would broaden your Rayleigh distribution. If every particle sees a different uh, large-scale flow, because this flow is time-varying or space-varying, then you get this characteristic excess. If there are no, if there are very small changes in the large-scale, the lowest-order modes of the system, you don't get that excess. Okay, and I'll show you these. These things all hold for the 3D case, and I'm just illustrating them here with this 2D case. So, how do you model this? You model this by incorporating the, the eddy motions in your transport. And basically, you say, I'm always moving from one eddy to the next eddy. And so I have an eddy size distribution. I have a velocity at which I'm orbiting the eddy. eddy and I have a time distribution in which I may re remain trapped. And so if I build a random walk out of those components so that my step size uh, is is dependent in this way, just circular eddies from one eddy to another. Um, and you take the eddy trapping radius to just be Kolmogorov. You take the trapping time to be uniform, and there's motivation for that from some other experiments. And you take the Lagrangian velocity to either be Maxwellian or that which is observed. You can reproduce those distributions so long as you also have some knowledge of the large scale flow. So here's that Lagrangian velocity distribution. Here is at very short times, the red is this uh, independently, the, the most interesting thing in my opinion of this, of this model is that you can sample each of these independently and randomly, okay? And so you can, you can move from one eddy to another eddy in a random walk sampling the eddy properties independently. It's not like large eddies are trapping longer or, or smaller. There's no correlations, at least in, uh, it appears to be no correlations, because you can successfully model these distributions at all times using these three components. So here's the short time component. It just reflects the velocity component, as I said earlier. Here's the eddy trapping component. You can see you do extremely well in, in modeling the PDF at intermediate times. And here's at long times, if you use the mean large scale flow, you don't fit it. But if you use the time dependent large scale flow, you fit it. If you actually evolve this flow and sample it randomly with your trajectories, then you can actually reproduce the PDF even at the longest times. OK, so, so that's what achieved, was achieved with the point vortex flow. We had the statistics of the flow. We pr produced this, and presumably, we could pump this back through a, uh, a scalar concentration. We haven't done that, uh, working on that, um, and, and reproduce the, the expectation value of scalar concentration. And the most interesting part, again, is that these distributions can be sampled uh, independently, and all you really need to know is the is those statistical properties and uh, the lowest order wave number components of the flow. And the reason you need the lowest order wave number components of the flow 
is because in this periodic domain, in a sense, there's no way to escape the lowest wave number. You can't move from one large, largest eddy to the next largest eddy. And so that eddy is fundamentally different than uh, the smaller eddies. OK, to move on, uh, we looked at stratified turbulence. And this is uh, uh, simulations, Boussinesque, of stably stratified force turbulence. And because there's this importance on these uh, large-scale flow and the time dependence of the large-scale flow, we did two simulations, one where we did Taylor Green forcing and another where, where we did random forcing, where the phase of the forcing was varied over one integral time. So there's a continuous change in the forcing, smooth and continuous change in the forcing over the, over the integral time scale of the flow. And you can see these are the trajectories. And this is for the Taylor Green forcing. And this is for the random forcing. And you can see something which looks familiar in terms of, of, the, uh, random, of the, the small scale random walk-ish motions. But you also see these very uh, systematic motions, which have to do with the fact that you generate large shearing motions in this stratified uh, force turbulence. And in the Taylor Green flow, they only develop in the portion of the domain where you have a node in the Taylor Green forcing. Okay? Whereas in the random forcing, you get multiple layers of different orientation, and these different colors come from particles moving in different orientations. And so in this flow, you can apply the same model and do quite well. And the, and the only snafu, the only place that where you get difficulty is that you have to include some knowledge of this large scale flow. And the distributions end up looking very odd because the time scale of that large scale flow compared to the time scale of the random walk type motion is what determines what the fundamental distribution shapes look like. And in order to show that in a very real way, I'll show you some work that uh, Piyush Agrawal, who's a graduate student at the University of Colorado, did um, with real data. On the sun, you can't see it very well, but there's small scale granular motions that move magnetic elements around. And there's large scale super granular motions that advect those small scale, those magnetic elements towards the network on the sun. So it's a 2D, again, a 2D flow. Both of these examples are 2D-ish uh, flows. And in this particular case, there's very strong scale separation between the granular time scales, the random walk time scales, and the super granular time scale. And so in fact, you get a ballistic scaling that starts going diffusive and then becomes ballistic again. And when you advect that distribution away from the, with, so you have essentially a very constant underlying long time scale drift. And what that does is it evects the distribution away from the origin and produces a nearly a Gaussian distribution at long times. You still have to go to zero at zero and a Rayleigh distribution at short times. And in fact, that distribution can be analytically expressed in terms of vessel functions and the limit of small uh, distance from the origin. It's really in the limit of large distance from the origin. The origin, it's nearly Gaussian. And so what this problem and the previous one tells you is, yeah, you can do the random walk. We can even, we can even model it with the same eddy components that we modeled uh, previously. But the, import, the large scale pl role plays the large scale flows play a very important role in the final transport, as, as you would expect. OK, and finally, um, I hope I uh, have a, a little time uh, to do this. Um, the homogeneous isotropic turbulence, I have five, 10, great, should be uh, fine. Um, uh, we took a, a um, simulation of Pablo Menini's. And we again took two forcings, one Taylor Green and one random forcing, again, to address this issue of uh, time dependent large scale flow. And you can see that in the log R, log T space, you again get ballistic scaling and diffusive scaling. 
So you get a ballistic and diffusive regime. We seeded this with 100,000 uh, particles. We made the same measurement of the probability of going a certain Eulerian distance after a certain amount of time. And you can see just, uh, I don't I hate that. Uh, I don't know why anybody would do that with their presentation, make things disappear and reappear, but it happened somehow, okay? Uh, in any case, there's an analog here between the point vortex flow, these are those three simulations, and this uh, three-dimensional homogeneous isotropic uh, simulation. In this case, you get slight sub uh, Maxwellian, it's a 3D flow, so this is now a Maxwellian distribution. Uh, again, trapping a very significantly sub Maxwellian, and you get this elevated tail in some cases. And so here are the two cases. In, in uh, this case, the forcing is, is uh, Taylor Green, and in this case, it's random. And you can see in the Taylor Green forcing, you have this highly time dependent uh, low wave, these are the three lowest wave number components in the flow. You have this very high, dependent, high amplitude, time dependent, uh, large scale flow, whereas in the random forcing you've beaten that down. And you can see that this long time excess is, is I'm going to show you, is again related to this uh, large scale flow. But you also see the same thing you saw previously. You get this deficit at intermediate times. And so in detail, those PDFs look like this. And in this case, the the Lagrangian velocity distribution is sub-Maxwellian rather than super-Maxwellian, super rarely as it was in the 2D random walk. And the red curve is just V delta T. And so you can see at very short times, uh, you know, 1% of the Lagrangian integral time, the PDF is just V delta T. That V delta T doesn't match as even at times as short as the Lagrangian integral time. You already see the evidence of trapping. V delta T is again the red, doesn't match the PDF, the, uh, the black. The dashed line is the Maxwellian fit to the black PDF. You already start seeing the evidence of trapping. At, at uh, the crossing time, the time be between when you go over from ballistic to, uh, to uh, diffusive scaling, you can see this very characteristic, I didn't point it out before, but this same very characteristic flat top PDF in the core maybe a little more visible in the non-log log plot, the same deficit uh, due to trapping. Um, uh, that trapping, the deficit persists. When you have time varying large scale flow, you start bringing up that distribution so that you end up with a, with a tail um, at, large, at long times, an excess at long times. And if you don't have a time varying uh, large scale flow in the randomly forced case, you just bring that tail up to match the Maxwellian PDF at long times. Um, is this all, um, uh, is this trapping really, can it be visualized directly? Uh, the answer to that is, uh, is yes. Um, uh, Sam Lee and, uh, and uh, John Klein uh, developed a really nice uh, visualization techniques for this. Uh, sorry, um, this is 10 to the 6 particles, okay? Um, they were all seeded uh, in 164th cubed portion volume of the domain. So the final density of particles, which is this reddish color, reflects the tra the, where the particles get stuck, not where they've been seeded, okay? And you can see that they're trapped around, these are, this is the kinetic helicity, you can see this trapping very predominantly along the vortex filaments in the domain. So again, uh, what they've done here is they took uh, a million particles, seeded them in a very small location, let those evolve for a long time so that the final number density of particles, which is what's visualized in the, in the color scale here, shows you where the particles get trapped in the domain, and they indeed get trapped around these vortex filaments. So can we do the same kind of modeling uh, for the 3D flow? Well, the difference is, is that you have two kinds of motion in the 3D case. You have motion trapped around the vortex filaments, and you have motion along the vortex filaments. If it's isotropic, then the, 
then the motion along the filaments maybe can be treated as a random walk in three dimension. So you have a 3D random walk due to motions along the filaments because the filaments are randomly oriented combined with a vortical contribution that is like in the Doogie case around the filaments. In order to model that, you have to know what fraction of the transport is, is being done along the filaments and what fraction of the transport is being done around the filaments. And so you need to sample two of these three distributions. One, uh, the, the two velocity components, parallel and perpendicular to the filament, or one of these velocity components and the helicity, kinetic helicity distribution. And the real question left here is, which two of these do I choose? And am I going to be so lucky that I can choose them again independently, sample them independently? Perhaps if I choose the helicity, I've, I've put in the right correlations, at least on a per sample basis. But if I choose the two velocity components, perhaps I'll fail because they depend on what the kinetic helicity, their ratio depends on the kinetic helicity. And so that's where we are. Uh, that's the plan is to, to do that modeling and see how close we can get. Um, I'll just summarize. It seems that we can construct a model for, for scalar transport based on these uh, eddy statistics. Um, uh, that type of modeling will allow us, hopefully, to do uh, rather than a bunch of ensemble, an ensemble of a whole bunch of models with different initial conditions to actually uh, compute the transport uh, st statistically and perhaps may be useful um, as a basis for subgrid modeling. Uh, extension to vector trans field transport is the next major challenge. And I'll stop, and I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> If anyone has questions, uh, I'll bring the mic to them. Uh, it was just curious in the in the when you showed the particle trapping, and the correlation with the um, kinetic helicity, what would it look like with just the vorticity? And was that simulation ha did it have a was it driven with kinetic helicity or? Net yeah. So this was driven by the Taylor Green. Oh yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. And the the vorticity is in the gray. The vor vorticity is shown in the gray. The red is the particle number density, and the two signs of the of the uh, helicity are on the right. Very interesting model. Could you describe how a particle exits? It it gets into the vortical motion trapped around a vortex. How does it exit that? Yeah, so, so in fact, the model is eddy to eddy, and there's a trapping time, and you move it from one eddy to the next, OK? But in fact, what's really happening is, in my understanding, is that you're feeling all the eddies all the time, right? And you're feeling different contributions. For reasons that I can't explain, you can model that as if you're moving from one dominant eddy to the next dominant eddy. Okay, so the superposition of all these eddy motions in your domain that is moving the particle, that motion can be modeled as if the, mo the particle is moving from one eddy to another. So, so perhaps the, the issue is simply that there's a dominant closest eddy, and when, it, when the particle trajectory or the evolution of the flow moves another eddy into a position where it's more dominant, the trajectory changes sign. Okay, and all those little changes of sign and uh, cause a trajectory that can be modeled as if there were independent eddy interactions along the way. That's how I think of it. Okay? Um, so if it was truly one eddy to the next, then you would feel only your nearest neighbor, and you would switch to the next eddy when somebody got closer to you than your nearest neighbor is. So you have to. So again, this is a. This is a. Actually, the motion is a sum of all the eddies. But if you were thinking just in terms of one eddy to another, you'd have to get close enough so the magnitude of the velocity field contributed by that second eddy is greater than the magnitude of the velocity field contributed by the first eddy. 
And, and that's how it's indeed modeled, but just with a statistic is how long you're trapped. But underlying that, so in some very weird way, I used to always be really against this eddy picture of turbulence because the spectrum, the Kolmogorov spectrum, is in, is in spectral space. And I always thought this Richards thing, thing of large eddies to smaller eddies, big whirls to little whirls, I always thought this was nuts, okay? Because all we have is, a, is something in spectral space. And to my surprise, in physical space, if you actually take that eddy picture seriously, you can actually model at least scalar transparency. Okay? In these particular flows. Seems to work very well in the point vortex. That's not a surprise. Point vortices, all they are is it, is board point vortices. There's no other component to the floor, flow. Uh, the stratified turbulence has a, has a very two-dimensional character. Uh, to, to, to it, um, uh, um, but maybe more surprising is that the same signatures in the PDF show up in the three-dimensional turbulence. Any more questions? Since global rotation will have a strong effect on helicity, what would you expect the effect on transport would be? Yeah. Um, I think it's probably, well, I'm guessing, all right? Uh, probably the largest effect on what the large scale mean flows give you. And the reason the PDF, the transport PDF, looks like it's non Maxwellian is because every particle feels a different, if the mean flow is spatially or temporally uh, non uniform, then each of the particles feels a different underlying mean flow. So in that case, you'd have a very strong, uh, perhaps uh, evolving components of the large scale flow. And so the long time PDF would be influenced. If that flow is very uh, steady, then you get the situation where you basically advect the PDF away from the origin and it starts to look Gaussian instead of Maxwellian. Okay? Um, but that requires a very steady flow of a very long time scale compared to the diffusive or random walk, random walk in quotes component of the underlying flow. Any more questions? I think we should probably move on. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, again. So, yes, the next speaker is Guido Buffetta from the University of Torino. We'll be speaking about rotating Rayleigh-Taylor uh, turbulence. And where am I from here? Okay, perfect. Thank you. So let me see if it. Okay, it works, perfect. So uh, let me start by thanking the organizer for inviting me to this nice workshop. And I will present some results on uh, uh, Rayleigh Taylor turbulence in presence of, of rotation and then in, uh, with time dependent acceleration. So this is the outline of my, okay, it doesn't work, the outline of my talk after a brief introduction to what is Rayleigh Taylor turbulence that probably most of you already know even better than me, and we discussed the effect of rotation in the early, early Taylor statistics, and then some recent results that we obtained for some exotic configuration which consider early Taylor turbulence with periodic, time periodic acceleration. So early Taylor uh, turbulence is developed <laughs> at the interface of uh, two fluids with two different density in presence of, a, of an acceleration. So the typical setup is in a heavy layer of fluid in the top of a light layer of fluid in presence of gravity. Okay, and so this is the, the, the interface is unstable. It, it develops the stability, the, the stability develops in a linear phase which becomes turbulent. So uh, we consider the simplest case of a single fluid, so visible uh, with two different temperature which means density, and the temperature jumps define the output number, which is the dimensionless temperature density difference. Uh, in the limit of small 
at good number, we can take the, we can assume that uh, the Businex approximation for an incompressible fluid holds, and so we use, I will use the Businex model, which has already been shown several times yesterday. Uh, so there is an equation for the velocity field coupled with the temperature field by the buoyancy term. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the difference with respect to other um, buoyancy driven flow is that the really Taylor tumor is a state dependent flow with an initial condition in which the velocity is zero everywhere and we have just a temperature jump, some potential energy at the beginning. It's a simple setup uh, for global convection in the, in the sense that there are no boundaries. In the sense boundaries are not relevant here, so there are no boundary layers. And this makes uh, the, the statistics much simpler than other setup like, for example, Rayleigh really Benard. So, for example, we don't have any left scale circulation in this problem. So, uh, let me, <coughs> what is the phenomenology of Rayleigh really Taylor turbulence? So, we can start from the energy balance that you can derive from the business model. So the kinetic energy, which uh, at the beginning is zero, is produced at, at the expense of potential energy, and some energy is dissipated by viscous dissipation. So epsilon is the standard viscous dissipation. So if you consider the equation in dimensional sense, you can rewrite kinetic energy at the time derivative of u square is proportional, is equal to this quantity. You can rewrite it in this way. And so you end by integration that a very simple prediction, the large scale fluctuation velocity fluctuation grows linear in time. Uh, by integration, you get that uh, the, 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 the mixing layer, the turbulence, the integral scale of turbulence grows quadratically in time. And I want to show you the first movie of the simulation. So what is shown here is a vertical cut of three-dimensional simulation, the temperature field. So uh, blue is cold and yellow is hot, of course. And so there is the unstable, unstable inter interface and, uh, okay, you see that the instability develops in a nonlinear plume that then becomes turbulent. So you have this turbulent mixing layer which grows in time according to this law, which is the dimensional prediction, like this square, which is grow under constant acceleration. It's not a surprise. The, the integral, uh, the, the large scale velocity in this flow grows linear in time. And so it means that this is a time evolving turbulence in the sense that the kinetic energy is injected in the system at a rate which grows in time. Okay, it's not stationary turbulence, it's something which is growing in time. And this produces small scale turbulent fluctuation. So for what concern, uh, sorry, the small scale statistics of really Taylor turbulence, there is a fundamental paper by Misha Chertoff some years, 15 years ago now. Uh, so the idea is the following. You have to make an ansatz in the, in the, for, the, for, the deriv for the derivation of Komogorov-like argument. So the ansatz is each is that the, the buoyancy term, which is injected the energy at a very large scale, becomes small and negligible at small scale in the turbulent cascade. Okay? There is no reason for that, but it's just an answer. So it means that at small scale, this term becomes negligible with respect to the uh, nonlinear inertial term, which means small regions of number. So at this point, if this becomes negligible, you, you recover the standard kolmogorov obuko picture. You have a, a turbulent standard turbulent cascade coupled with a passive scalar. Temperature becomes passive. And so you end with a prediction, which is the standard <coughs> kolmogorov obuko scaling for the velocity and temperature fluctuation, which have a scaling exponent one third. And what is the difference with respect to usual turbulence, as I said before, is that the, the, the energy flux is not constant here, but it's growing in time. So you expect to have a scaling exponent also, temporal scaling exponent for velocity and temperature fluctuation. So this is the prediction, which can be right or wrong, correct or not, but at least it's self-consistent in the sense that if you use this scaling and you compute the Richardson number, you get, which is the ratio of this term over this one, you get that the richest of number goes to zero as you go in proceeding the cascade to small scale. So it's consistent with the assumption. This is not consistent in two dimensions because in two dimensions you expect to have an inverse cascade, so you go to large scale. And so in this case, the richest of number will, will grow. And indeed, in two dimensions, well, the prediction is to have a different scaling. So we perform extensive numerical simulation or really Taylor turbulence at different for different uh, resolution, but I want to just to show you some, some very simple result. So this is the mean temperature profile, so the vertical uh, profile of the temperature average of the horizontal plane. So at the beginning, you have this jump, okay, which is the initial condition, and then the mixing layer develops, and then in the mixing layer, the temperature profile is more or less linear. And from this 
sides from this uh, linear step part, you can derive what is the, 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 the width of the, the mixing layer. And you see that, indeed, it grows like the t square, as predicted. Okay? And you can also compute to measure what is the dimensionless coefficient, which is very important for application that you cannot derive from dimensional argument. So another result that I want to show you for standard relative turbulence is the, 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 <coughs> the each transport. So uh, as in other system, we, we measure the each transport, the turbulence each transport in terms of the Nassen number and uh, as a function of the Rayleigh number. Okay, the difference with respect to Rayleigh Benar convection is that the Rayleigh they're both the Rayleigh number, the Reynolds number, and the Nassen number are time dependent. So if you use the dimensional scaling that I showed before, you, you expect that the Nassen number is proportional grows like the power three of time. The same for the Reynolds number, while the Rayleigh number goes as t to the power six. And so immediately you, you get what is called the ultimate state of thermal convection. The Nassen is proportional to Rayleigh to the power one half. Okay, and this is indeed confirmed by the simulation. So these are simulation for different prank number, scaling with the prediction for prank, which is power exponent one half, and the, 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 the black line represents the one half, the exponent one half of the ultimate state. So it seems that uh, it's not a surprise at the end because uh, bu uh, here <coughs> boundary are not present, so boundary layer doesn't play any role. So it's, uh, it's not a surprise to, to observe the ultimate scale state scaling. So I don't want to discuss small scale statistics, but I want to go to the first part of the result about re rotating relative turbulence. So, <coughs> uh, okay, the, the motivation, uh, I don't need to make the motivation here, as astrophysical and geophysical application where the rotation is naturally present. So I will consider again the Businex equation with an additional term. Uh, uh, Due to, due to rotation, and rotation is then direction of gravity. Okay, so this is the setup. You have a vertical gravity and the axis of rotation. And it's well known since the work of Chandra Sekar that rotation is able to reduce the instability. The linear instability really tailored is reduced by the presence of rotation. Uh, but we investigate what is the effect of rotation in the nonlinear turbulent phase. It's a work done in collaboration with uh, Andrea Mazzino and Stefano Musac. Uh, so there are some numerical confirmation and also experimental of the effect of uh, um, rotation and the linear instability. So this is a work done by Carnevale collaborator some years ago, numerical work. And then there is a recent experiment, which is very nice, by uh, Baldwin and collaborators, uh, so an inhibition of relative instability by rotation. So the experiment is the following. There is uh, some... Uh, the, 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 the pink fluid is the heavy fluid, which is levitating, is a paramagnetic fluid levitating our uh, lighter fluid. And this is in the absence of rotation, and then in presence for stronger rotation. And you see that uh, the, the stability in presence of rotation is reduced with respect to the non rotating case. Okay? So, but the prominent point that I want to address what are the effects of rotation on the nonlinear turbulent phase? So again, we did some numerical simulation for different velocity and different, different rotation, different angular speed, angular velocity. And uh, let me show another movie. OK, so here is two examples. The, the, on the left is without rotation, the, the right with rotation, with the same initial condition. And already from the movie, you see there are some differences. So the stability is lower. And then also the growth of the missing layer is lower in the presence of rotation. OK, the, you don't see the movie very well here. Sorry. And also you observe that uh, the, the, the shape of the thermal plume are different. In, in the absence of rotation, the flow is more or less isotropic, while it looks more anisotropic in this case. The plume looks more elongated. OK. So uh, what is the effect of rotation? We can measure. We can quantify the effect of rotation in terms of the Rosby number. And also, in this case, also the Rosby number in this case is time dependent. It's not a constant quantity. And, uh, but I want to make a, a remark, which is important, that the Rosby number, which is given by the, as usual, by the, the large scale velocity over omega, uh, the large typical integral scale, uh, if you assume that rotation is very small, so you, you assume that at the beginning, the scaling is the usual scaling for Rayleigh Taylor, so velocity grows linear in time, and h, the mixing layer, grows like t square. You add that the Rosby number decays as 1 over t. So it means that even if omega is very small, at long time, the Rosby number becomes small, and so rotation becomes dominant, okay? at, for time longer than 1 over omega. 
So no matter how small is omega, at, at, the, at the end, asymptotically, rotation becomes important. You have a rotation. And so eventually, you get what is called the rotation dominated regime, which we already saw yesterday, the case of Rayleigh Benard. And in this case, you can assume that there is a balance between the, the Coriolis term and the, business, uh, the buoyancy term that predicts that the large scale velocity is not growing anymore, but reach a constant velocity, which is inverse proportionally to omega. And as a consequence, the mixing layer is not growing like T square anymore, but uh, grows linear in time. So let's look at what the simulation show. OK, so this is the, the growth of the mixing layer for three different simulations. The first one is a standard case without rotation. You see, again, the T square law. And then in presence of rotation for two different omega, you see that indeed the growth of the mixing layer is reduced also in the turbulent phase by the presence of rotation. And also for strong rotation, the growth is linear. It's not quadratic anymore uh, in agreement with the prediction, with the simple prediction of a balance between Coriolis and, and Busenest there. Uh, also, the other prediction was that the, the RMS velocity, the large scale velocity, reaches saturation and doesn't grow anymore. And again, it is confirmed by the simulation. In the presence of rotation, we have that this is for the vertical velocity, but the, the horizontal is the same. The, the velocity saturates at the value which is inversely proportional to omega. OK, so re the rotation reduces the RMS velocity in, this turbulent, in the turbulent mixing layer. But what is remarkable is that uh, anisotropy at large, at least a large scale, is weakly affected by rotation. What the plot is uh, the ratio of the vertical over the horizontal velocity fluctuation. And they are, the system is an anisotropic because of gravity, but rotation do, do not change too much the, the anisotropy. I mean, the anisotropy is, so is, the anisotropy is not in the, in the velocity field, but the anisotropy, I will show in the, in the next slide, is in the temperature field. OK. Uh, so the important things that I want to discuss, the last thing for this setup, is the, <coughs> the coupling between uh, velocity and uh, temperature field. So these are the vertical profile for the temperature and for the vertical velocity. Okay? So the red, case, the red line represents the standard case without rotation. We have a mixing layer. At a given time, we have a mixing layer, which, which is linear, as we discussed before. And what is remark what I want to, 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 to stress here is that the mixing layer is, is the same size of the support of the velocity fluctuation. So the, the mixing layer for velocity is the same as the mixing layer for temperature, if you want. Okay? The size of where the velocity is different from zero is exactly inside the, the mixing layer. So in the presence of strong rot is of rotation, which is the blue line, we have that the mixing layer is reduced, okay, as we've seen before. But on the contrary, if you look at the velocity profile, the velocity profile is larger than the, the case with, uh, without rotation. So it means that in a rotating case, the velocity extends outside the mixing layer. And there is a decoupling between velocity field and temperature field. OK, the reason is we, we, we expect that we, we suggest that the reason for that is that there is a bidimensionalization of the flow. And so the, the, the generation of Taylor Perlman column that makes the velocity independent, almost independent on theta. Uh, this has important consequence for the transport of theta, we'll show you in the next slide. OK, what I show here is a more quantitative way to measure this, this, uh, the, this um, difference between velocity and temperature profile. So what I plot here are the integral length scale, defined in this way, based on the horizontal vertical velocity and on temperature. Okay. So the, the open symbol are for the case without rotation. The three lines are one over the other. It means that the integral scale, as a function of time, the integral scale based on velocity on temperature field are the same in this case. In presence of rotation, which are these three lines here, you have that uh, the horizontal and vertical velocity, uh, sorry, the, the temperature integral scale is reduced with respect to the non-rotating case, as I've shown before. But on the contrary, the velocity is increased. So there is a decoupling between the integral scale of velocity and integral scale of, uh, of temperature. So it affects the correlation. And since the correlation between velocity and temperature is essentially the, the, the heat transfer, we expect to have a reduction of the heat transfer. And indeed, OK, very, very quickly, this is the Nassel number, the red symbol, as a function of the Rayleigh number. So this point here. Uh, the square represented the without rotation, and they, they follow the, the 
R2, R2 one half uh, Reynolds, uh, Rayleigh to the power one half. And in presence of rotation, we have a reduction of the nascent number at a given Rayleigh number, not only as a function of time, but also as a function of Rayleigh. So last two minutes, I think, I, would, I want to show you some very recent result on Rayleigh Taylor tubal in presence of time dependent acceleration. So uh, I don't want to give the, me to read the motivation. Let me just show you that uh, in the case of time periodic acceleration, which is somehow an exotic problem, okay, it's not very uh, application. So the motivation is that for inertial confined infusion, people study a, 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 a protocol in which the what is called a cell, the cell a cell. So it means that acceleration has a reverse sign once and then go back to the stable case. And we, we extend to, to the more complex protocol. So we consider uh, really Taylor tumor is in presence of time periodic acceleration, which alternates phase of unstable and stable stratification. So at the level of linear stability, it's known that it's possible to, be, to get the, to, to have a, the dynamic stabilization for sufficiently fast vibration of the fluid. Let me show this short movie. This is an experiment in the, in the lab. There is a heavy fluid on the top of a light fluid. This is a shaker. And when the shaker is working, you see that it stabilizes. Okay, and then you stop the shaker and the stability develops. Okay, so again, the effort, what are the effort? Is, this an effort? is there any effect of time periodic acceleration in the nonlinear turbulent phase? So we perform a simulation of uh, in the, within the Busingesk uh, approximation with different acceleration protocols with the sinusoidal uh, acceleration. Or what I will show in the, in the next slide is for the square wave, square wave protocol, which is even simpler. OK, let me show the last movie. So OK, this is the usual, the usual two-dimensional cut of the temperature field. Initially, it's unstable. The gravity is pointing. To uh, downwards, and then the, after half period, the gravity reverses in the uh, upper right on the upwards, and then switch back with a period which is three times the instability period for the linear instability at the large scale. So that is different from what I show in the movie. So it's not fast uh, periodic uh, uh, fluctuation, but it's low. So is um, the, 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 the periodicity of the, of the acceleration is low, low compared to the instability. So there is time for the flow to develop the instability. So if you look at what happened, uh, so it's very surprising because at the, at the beginning, it works like uh, it works as, as you expect. So in the unstable phase, the mixing layer goes, then there is a stable phase, it stabilizes, then goes again and stabilizes and so on. But then if you go on a longer time, okay, sorry, that works. Okay, so now as unstable goes, unstable, st uh, then unstable, stable, and start growing. But after five or six period, something different happens. You see that after a while, it stops growing and reaches an asymptotic size. It doesn't change anymore. So this was very surprising at the beginning. And you can keep running forever and doesn't. And you also see that tubal is decaying, OK? And this is surprising because you are in a stable phase. There is still a lot of potential energy available in the system, but it's unable to convert into kinetic energy. So if you compute the evolution of the mixing layer, you get something like this, OK? At the beginning, it's, it's growing, not this square because there is the phase of a stable stratification, but there is richer saturation. And this is, is quite general. I mean, with different protocols, different periods, we always get OK? So these are the results for three different periods, two, three, and four. And we get always a saturation of the mixing layer at different rate. Uh, so we want to, to make uh, some, not a theory, but last to understand what's happening. So the first thing is we can try to make a dimensional rescaling of this, lane, this, the, this line. So the idea is that uh, P, the period, is the only time scaling the dynamics. So this suggests that you have to rescale the time with P. And since in the, the case without uh, periodicity, so p period equal infinite, we know that uh, the mixing layer goes like t square. We want to rescale res h as with p square. So if you try to use rescaling, you get almost perfect collapse of the line. Okay, so they go one on top of the other, and so it seems to work very well. And uh, in the uh, one one more slide. 
And in the late stage, we observed turbulence suppression. was already clear from the movie. But if you look at the vertical, at the velocity fluctuation, at the beginning, the velocity fluctuation grow in a stable phase. But then you see that they decay. So asymptotically, turbulence is not supported anymore. The temperature vertical profile is uh, frozen at the given sites. And the, the, the temperature fluctuation inside the mixing layer decays in time. And so this decay of turbulent fluctuation also becomes more homogeneous. And so this suggests a possible way to understand what's happening based on a very simple idea on linear stability analysis. Okay, because it takes some time for, let's call it the instability time for the available potential energy to, to be converted in potential in a kinetic energy during the instable phase. Okay, we cannot estimate TU, I'm unable to estimate TU in, for the turbulent phase, but we can estimate for the linear, for linear stability analysis, which is, which becomes a better approximation a long time since the, the, the turbulence decay. Okay, so if you take a, a temperature profile which has these, these things, there is a linear gradient which connects two plateau. Okay, you can perform the linear stability analysis, you get that the growth rate square is given by this expression. For very steep gradient, you recover the standard Rayleigh result, square root of AGK. K is the weight number of the perturbation, is linear instability. Yeah? But for wide mixing layer, which is relevant here, you get that the growth rate is independent on K and is proportional to 1 over H. H is the size of the mixing layer. So it means that the time, the instability time, which is 1 over lambda, is proportional to the square root of the mixing layer. So it means that as the mixing layer goes, the stability time is larger and larger. At a certain point, it becomes larger than the alpha of the period. And so you have no time to develop the stability. And the system stops. This is the, the interpretation that we have. OK, so these are the conclusion of my talk. But instead of the conclusion, let me take the last 10 seconds to make an announcement that uh, in one year, in September 9, 2019, there will be the European Turbulent Conference will be in Torino. I'm among one of the organizers. Is so uh, now we have the web page which is on. So if you are interested, you are, of course, you are welcome to come to Torino. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Guido. Uh, any questions? Thank you for a nice talk. So in the rotating case, um, you, you showed that the uh, Nusselt number was suppressed. Okay, But do you have a prediction for that in terms of the scaling? You didn't, I, I may have missed that. Did you, did you have a? In terms of, OK. The ultimate scaling. In the really Bernard case, you can make, you know, if you get the effective Rayleigh number, then you can, you know, back of the envelope sort of produce an exponent for what the scaling should be. Can something equivalent be? Can you yeah. do something equivalent here? So thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, so the di first of all, the difference with respect to, to, to Rayleigh Benard is that we have a, a reduction of Nussel for any value of rotation because we don't have boundaries, so we don't have this mechanism by Ekman pumping from the boundaries. Okay? So this is the main difference. We always observe a reduction of the Nussel number. So for what concerns the scaling exponent, as you can see here, is very, this is very noisy, so we don't have uh, really, we did play seriously to check if there is possible to predict an exponent for this, uh, for this scaling. We don't even know if there is any scaling here. So. Yes, it should be possible, yes. Yes, thank you, we didn't try. No, it could be interesting, yes. You, you asked, um, you, you showed that when, uh, when you have the rotating case versus the non-rotating case, how the flow becomes less isotropic. But I assume also the critical rating number has changed. So how do you know, how can you separate between, between these two and this kind of a geometry or convection world? In which sense the critical? But you, when you showed, the, you showed the two cases, one, yeah. and you mentioned that the, the turbulence is looking more isotropic. But I assume also that the critical rating number is changing when you increase the, ro the rotation rate, right? Uh, but in Rayleigh Taylor, you don't, Rayleigh Taylor, you don't have a critical rainy number. Rayleigh Taylor is zero, the critical rainy number. I mean, it's always stable. No, but when, in the, in, in the, when you had the movies with the two convective cases, right, one was more isotropic than the other. You must have had a, some, some kind of critical rainy number because you had convection. In this case, you mean? In this movie, for this movie? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I don't... 
Sorry, I don't understand the question. The, from the velocity, point of velocity field is not more as anisotropic. Eh? They are more or less the same. This is the ratio of the vertical to the horizontal RMS velocity. For the three case, no rotation, and with two case with rotation, and you see they are more or less the same. So the velocity field is not more anisotropic. What is the, dif the main difference with that we found is that there is the decoupling between temperature and the velocity. So the temperature is very, as this elongated bloom that we show in the movie. But if you look at the velocity field, you don't see anything. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, probably not the answer to your question. I was just going to say, in the astrophysical case, it might also be an interesting case as if the top fluid is rotating with respect to the bottom fluid. So I was just going to ask about next, that. Next, yeah. next no, OK. Yes, I think it's very interesting. I don't know anything about about that, but unfortunately. Yes. Thank you. Any more questions for Guido? If not, uh, we'll thank the speaker again. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce Andrew Gilbert from the University of uh, Axer, who's going to be talking about geometric generalized uh, Lagrangian mean theories. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, sorry. No. Second, sorry. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, I can't. Oh, good. Okay, sorry. So, pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to this, um, this workshop, which I'm very much enjoying. Um, this is a, some work with Jack Van Est in Edinburgh, and it's going to be a talk in two halves. Um, the first half, I'm going to try and get across the ideas of Lagrangian averaging. In the second half, I'm going to try and put it in the context of a more geometrical interpretation, which is what we've been working on. Okay, so um, let's just think about the Euler equation and um, in 3D space, because our usual notation here. And if we're going to average at a fixed point in space, we have a point, point X, we have various flows of waves from ensemble average, we rapidly obtain this equation here, with the angle brackets noting the average. And we have the problem, the classic turbulence problem, that the single point average equation is linked to the two point average. And likewise, the two points is linked to the three point. And you have the closure problem. Alternative way of approaching averaging, which in some ways pushes the difficulty somewhere else, of course, <laughs> but also has some major benefits, is to think about Lagrangian averaging. So instead of averaging at some fixed point in space, you instead look at one, look at a fluid parcel. So at some initial time t, it's at some point a. And then in some flow here, that parcel might be here. Another float might be there. Another float might be there. And you're going to average over the parcel, which has different spatial locations, rather than at a single point in space. And oops, this, these ideas go back to work of Andrew Sauer, and actually even back even a bit further than that, and um, was really picked up and a major amount of work done on this idea by Andrews and McIntyre in 1978. What's the idea? I'm going to talk about the primarily about the Andrews McIntyre theory or say, framework, if you wish. So we have our Lagrangian parcel. And we imagine it being moved to its final location in two steps. First, we'll move to a point x, and then we move to x plus some fluctuating piece xi. Okay, so 
That's how we get from our initial point to the final point. Okay? And then we have an ensemble of these things. So imagine we've got lots of xi's all labeled by alpha. And this is our mean point, if you like. And then these are the fluctuations. A goes to X. And X can go to various xi's, depending on the realization. Okay? And then the question is, of course, and it sort of seems like an obvious question, is, okay, you've got all these points where the particle's gone, maybe up here, if you like. What's the mean point? What's the X to choose? Well, the theory of Andrew McIntyre, Andrews McIntyre does the obvious thing in three dimensions, which is just to choose the spatial average point. So if, you, if your particles go to here, here, and here, your X is the spatial average, and the average, of the average of the coordinates. And so you're imposing this condition that the average of the fluctuations is zero. And with this, you can then do some Lagrangian averaging. So you have this averaging operator, which is bar L, and essentially take the sum variable, say the flow variable, the velocity, at each point in each ensemble, each ensemble member, and you average like that. So essentially you're carrying some quantity like u from these points to x and then averaging. Okay. And it turns, so they, you can then apply this operator, this, this process, this um, mechanism, if you like, to the Euler equation or to other equations. So here's the, um, well, I haven't got the Euler equation written up anymore. It's gone. But you have that or any other equation governing the waves and you can apply that. You can take the quantities from those points, bring them back to the mean point and then average. And it turns out the Euler equation ha turns into a very nice structure. Um, it turns to this equation here. I've got rate of change of something. This is basically like u dot grad or something. And you're carrying now something a bit different, which can be thought of as being a momentum v. So this is your new Euler equation. It basically says rate of change of momentum is carrying the momentum in a mean flow, and you've got a pressure term. And this is a lead derivative technically, but let's just think of it as being u dot bar dot grad of v. I'm not going to define v here, but we'll see it later on. And why is this useful? Because it is useful because if you're not average, then you've got the mean flow here, the mean flow here. So when you average, that's the same for all the realizations. And you get rate of change of this momentum plus transport of this average momentum is a pressure term. And that's the benefit of, the Lagrange, of this Lagrangian framework. You've gone from a quadratic quantity in the fluctuations to a linear quantity. Because in some ways you've been in the difficulty elsewhere, but um, anyway, you've, you've made some gain in this, in this, this step here. And you also gain this Kelvin circulation theorem. So if you now look at the circulation around some loop, you now take the circulation of this momentum V. Um, that's in a given realization. You work out the circulation of this around a loop being carried in the flow. And if you average this equation, you end up with the mean of the momentum because these loops are being carried in the mean flow. So you have a Kelvin circulation theorem. So the benefits here, essentially, is, your, is, is that you're capturing the effects of, let's say, waves on a mean flow. But you're naturally building in the conservation of circulation and of vorticity. Your average equations have got those nice structural properties that you had in your original, original Euler equation. Okay. And that's a very natural thing to do for many waves, which is why this is an important framework of Andrews and McIntyre. And, yeah, essentially many geophysical fluid dynamical applications, you can try and parameterize the effects of waves by creating some momentum V that you're going to use. And you then focus on the mean flows, and you're pushing the waves somewhere else to be dealt with and understood. OK, but there's some issues with this, which is where Jack and I started to work on it. One is, how do you actually take the average of points in more general context? So in, in ordinary 3D space, take some points, we can look at the average position. But what if those points are on a sphere? Well, it's obvious how to take the average of points in a sphere. Or what about a spherical shell, where you have points here, here, and here? How do you take the average of those points? Well, obviously, you might leave the spherical shell. What else? This framework has an issue with divergence with solenoidal fields, um, incompressible flows. All your original flows may be incompressible. In your, each realization may have an incompressible flow. Your averaging process 
produce a mean flow that isn't incompressible, the so-called divergence effect of Michael McIntyre uh, and co. That's not very desirable. You've gone from one framework, if you like, something rather different. Mathematically, there's something slightly strange here because if you're taking things like vectors and other things at different points in space, then just take the components and moving them is not what you might call very geometric. And it's sort of okay in 3D space, but if you're in a more general context, like on a spherical, like on a sphere, for example, it's not clear how you move a vector from a point in the sphere to another point in the sphere. So it sort of lacks some sort of nice mathematical properties. And underlying this is sort of question of why does the theory work and what are the choices that you're making? Um, there are other ways of writing the theory. Sound Roberts was another approach. What's, what's the underlying structure? Okay. So what we, Jack and I, found ourselves doing independently initially, and then we're um, better, thanks to thank you Steve Tobias, actually. Um, what we started to do is to look at a more general framework. And it turns out that even though you know, real space is three-dimensional, um, it does help to actually look in a more abstract setting because it clarifies what's going on. So I'm going to consider flows on some arbitrary manifold. And this is going to become fairly differential geometry heavy. So I'm afraid I haven't got time to really go through all the basics of it. I'll try and make it intuitive, but I'm afraid it will be quite a lot of notation, etc. So we start with some flow on some arbitrary manifold, which I say could be a 2D sphere. It's not that peculiar. <laughs> uh, or spherical shell. But, um, and we've got to think about how you move quantities around, like how you move velocity from here, let's say, to there. And this brings in the machinery what's called pullbacks and push forwards. Okay. And the goal is, the, well, we're going to look at those quickly. Look at averaging and try to understand how this gives you the various theories that there are. We'll go as far as I can without running run out of time, that is, and our own suggestions of how to do this. I say the key point, I think, for me anyway, is that even if ultimately you might work in R3, your geometrical viewpoint gives you a key for understanding what's going on here and how it's all working. Okay, so um, the appropriate setting to understand this on a flow on an arbitrary manifold goes back to Arnold, 1966. And you have this manifold, a metric, and some measure of volume, and you have a flow map. So the whole ideas are basically based on Lagrangian ideas. You go from the initial particle positions to the final particle positions. And this is a notation that's, that's being used more, more Jack than me, to be honest. But, um, and we're taking everything to preserve volumes. This flow map is in this set of all the volume-preserving flow maps that there are on M. And you can measure distance between points on M. So ignore the definition, really. You can take two points on M and just find the closest path between them, or all the possible paths there might be. And that's the distance between points on wherever you're working. You can instead, if you wish, or sorry, you can, you can as well, look at the distance between flow maps. So you take one flow map in this big set of flow maps, and another flow map, phi and psi, let's say, and ask how far apart they are. And essentially, it's the it's the distance in terms of how how much flow how much of a flow you need to do to get from that flow map to that flow map. And again, it's just some minimum over all the possible paths, all the possible flows getting from this configuration of particles to that configuration of particles gives you the distance between these. Now, the key idea of Arnold, why he's rightly, well, this and many other things, why he's rightly very famous, is that um, the Euler equation comes from geodesic motion in this big space. So you've got this space of all the possible volume-preserving maps, and you have geodesics. You can measure distances between them, and so you can have this idea of GD6 is the shortest path locally. And if you go through the calculation, it gives you the Euler equation in this form. So it's dt of something plus basically a lead derivative, u dot grad of something, is basically a pressure term minus grad of something, if you like. And but the new, what you're transporting, is in this general setting, it's not quite the, the velocity u, it's what you get by applying the metric to u. It's a so-called one form. And uh, new is u flat, or it's g applied to u. And so you've got this natural separation between what you're transporting, this momentum, which is one form, and the flow u, which is a vector field. And your Euler equation is like that. Okay. And this leader of is just like u dot grad for our purposes, really. Okay. But this is key, because 
when we saw the Andrews McIntyre theory, we had transport of that big V by a, a U. And here we've got transport of something by a U. Okay. Um, again, you can write it more familiarly in sort of um, you know, using cosine derivatives. Okay, you can also do MHD in the same kind of way if you like with a magnetic field and a possible one form as well. Right. Okay, so um, if you've got different flows and different Lagrange parcels and different bits of space, you've got to basically move things around. And you have this idea of moving vectors around. And this is essentially the Cauchy solution. You take a vector, and if you move it somewhere, you move the points at each end, you may stretch it or rotate it, whatever. And that's the natural mo motion of vector fields. Okay? Well, something we're very familiar with, something we're very familiar with. These one form fields, like the momentum, behave differently. In fact, they behave like gradients. If you take a gradient, let's say it's cold here and hot here, it's a gradient. If you stretch it out, the gradient gets weaker. The vectors get strengthened by stretching them in that direction. <laughs> like, gradients get weaker. And so these one forms have a different rule for how they're actually carried around. And they behave like gradients. Gradients are one forms. Okay, so basically, you move fields around uh, in the appropriate way, both vectors and one forms. So now we do some of the um, sort of we start applying this to the to the um, problem at hand. So imagine you've got a whole ensemble of flow maps and the corresponding fluid flows. So these are time-dependent maps; they're so moving particles around. And essentially, the key idea is this big equation here. We're writing each flow map as a composition of a mean flow map, and then the fluctuations. That corresponds to that what Andrews and McIntyre had. You go to the mean point, let's say here, from your original point, and then you go to the various different realizations. Last time soon. Let's see. Okay. And you can consider that being particles moving around, or you consider it the level of the whole map. So the whole, in this big space F diff M of all the possible maps, you've got your mean map, and then all the fluctuating maps. Okay, let me skip, go a bit faster, actually. So if you skip through this, what happens is you take the Euler equation in each realization, or it could be some more complicated equation. You put in more physical effects into this, if you like, like magnetic fields and other things. Uh, you, know, um, you start with the Euler equation for each ensemble member. The alpha label is there. And then you apply a pullback. You basically move the whole equation from whichever flow you're operating on at the moment to the mean one. And so essentially applying the full back, pull back, which carries everything backwards by the fluctuating flow. And you apply it to the equation here. And the key step in here is here, because when you pull back this thing here, it changes from transporting the actual flow, the U alpha, to transporting the mean flow, U bar. So when you actually apply this, the equation becomes this. So you've got dt plus transporting the current flow becomes dt plus transporting the mean flow of something that's been pulled back. This was noted by Andrew Sard initially. If you then average, so you average over all the possible alphas, then again, you've got this wonderful property that the u bar is the same for all the fluctuating flows. So when you average, you're averaging, again, that piece there and not, you don't, get a, you don't get a quadratic average, you just get the average of the momentum. Okay, so um, you get lots of nice properties. Essentially you're having, you get what you get in Andrews and McIntyre, you get transport of some momentum, some average momentum by the mean flow. And so you've got conservation of circulation, you've got all the right properties. So this is the general framework in which you um, um, can understand the theory of Andrews and McIntyre. Um, so you can look at the so-called pseudomoment, which is the effect of the waves sort of coded in that. I better skip that actually. But what's remarkable about all this stuff, which is why I think Jack and I find it so interesting, is that you get all this framework without actually specifying what, what average you're using. So that nice behaviour of the Euler equation pulling back and the mean flow and being able to average it, it doesn't matter what average you take. Anything works. And so the what Andrews McIntyre did is just one choice that one can make. So they decided to make to take the average map is the basically average of the coordinates of all the fluctuating maps, if you might, 
do in 3D space. So that average point literally is the average of those coordinates. Um, and then you get all the sort of properties that, um, that I discussed earlier. It's not sort of geometrical in the sense that it's not something you can do beyond R3. You can try and do something by minimizing some distance on the more general, the more general framework. You get a divergence, and you, you know, have various properties. Um, another choice is Andrew's, was by Andrew Sowell and Paul Roberts, who basically joined up from the fluctuating flows to the mean by some steady flow fields, which has some advantages, but there are also some disadvantages. I better brush a little bit, actually, I'm nearly finished. Um, and then we also put in our own two penneth, which is to think about joining the flow map to the mean map by minimizing the distance in this big space of maps. So we think the most natural thing to do with those disadvantages is to basically take a mean which keeps the mean flow divergence free and which is geometric, etc. But there's some complicating actually working things out, needless to say. The Andrews and McIntyre theory you know, has some, some disadvantages from the point of view of, of um, for example, getting a mean flow which is, has a divergence, but it's actually very easy to work many of the things out. We've got something which looks cleaner mathematically, but maybe it's less practical. But either way, I think you, what we learned is how these theories sort of fit together. And here's my conclusions. Let's just get through them quickly. So um, our perspective was that taking flow flows in arbitrary manifolds and then being really clear at how you move quantities around from one place to another really exposes the underlying mathematical structure of these kinds of theories. And just show you what you have to do in certain ways, you know, what, what you can't do in certain ways. Okay. And one key point is that you, you're actually very free to choose the kind of average you want to choose. The, the choice of Andrews McIntyre is just one choice that you could make. There could be lots of other ones. And we have our own natural geometrical choice. But it isn't necessarily the most straightforward when it actually comes to doing calculations. And you can also try and work with other things like boundaries and perfect MHD. And we're looking at, so we're looking at this a bit further. All the manifolds we're looking at had no particular symmetry. We're just looking at any flonial manifold. But clearly, if you have something like a sphere, you may, you know, you've got a symmetry of rotation, and you want to then exploit that to then make all this framework a lot simpler. So that's the uh, end of my talk. So thank you, thank you very much. Any questions for Andrew? Hi, Andrew. When you say that you have compressibility, you've lost div, div u equals zero. Um, how bad is it? Is it acoustic, or do you have shocks? I mean, are you going well, to have problems like that? Yeah, I mean, I think, so what happens with, um, and it's not that bad, no. I mean, with the Andrew Zakatai framework, okay, you start with, all these, well, you start with all these incompressible flows of waves. Now, assume the waves aren't very large amplitude, then essentially you, um, you'll end up with just a slightly compressible flow. The problem is you've got to then build that into the, if, you, if you're doing a theory then, you've got to then keep control of that or keep, keep a handle on that. So the idea, of these, the way these, these methods are used as far as I understand it, and Jack's more expert than I am, is that you you go from a flow of waves to a mean flow. And you have some way of parameterizing the waves. Okay, so you say, well, the wave activity has got this level here, and you have some use, for example, quadratic type theory to keep track of what the waves are doing. But with that, that mean flow is now a bit compressible. So you've got to sort of keep track of its divergence as you're using it. But it's not very compressible. Which is extra complication you've got in the system you're using. Oh, thank you for a uh, very nice talk. Thanks very much. And and I, I was just wondering, is the uh, McIntyre Andrews McIntyre formulation the only one type of averaging that will preserve circulation and vorticity? No, no, no. The point is that no. The point is that let's get back to here for a second. What is remarkable about this is that all these average methods. Pull back, sorry. Second, sorry. This whole framework preserves the circulations. 
no matter how you average. So when you go back to here, you're taking this composition of your full map is your mean map with a adding on a fluctuation. Okay? And the beauty is when you, you write down this, uh, sorry, there's a point, Scott. <laughs> here we are. You write down this equation here, and you worry about how I should specify this. And you think, well, let me not worry too much about this for the moment. Let me just leave that as some mean map. And then you start doing manipulations with pulling things back. So you're using the fluctuating maps to carry things back to the mean. Okay, all this stuff is then going through, and you get to this, and you average. And you get right down to here, let's say, and, and you've nowhere used what kind of mean you've taken. Not specified anyway. You've not, the, the calculations go through without any constraint on what the mean is. And all this, going right down to sort of here, you know, is independent of what mean you choose. That's what's remarkable. That's what the geometrical picture pulls out for you. You then have to then do calculations and, for example, try and work out some things beyond this point. For example, what is the difference between the... Um, you've got the mean flow, so you've got kind of mean momentum. Okay? You've got the U-bar, you'd have a new bar, if you like. And that'll be different from this new bar L, because you had those waves. When you pull them back to being no waves anymore, you have basically fed them into this new bar L. And all the waves you had are now sitting inside here. And if you want to look at the difference between the waves and the mean flow, if you like, that's into here. So to actually get a handle on any of these kinds of things, you need to then specify what the mean is. And then different choices of mean give you different theories beyond that point. Oops, sorry. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, we'll reconvene okay. at 10.30. Thank you very much. Thank you.